afternoon. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Love to see you all. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Milo Noblet, who is the Youth Committee Deputy Chair, and he was also UK, T UK Team Leader for Youngsters on the Air, uh, 2017. In case you hadn't heard me say it a million times already, um, at uh, Gilwell Park in uh, in August, he'll be he'll be talking about this summer's event. Be talking about the planning which went into it. It's aged considerably in that process, but he'll tell you all 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 about that. He'll also share the experience of being both a team leader and a member of the organising team, and the lessons which are learned from an international event for almost 80 young radio amateurs. I mean, it's a major uh, exploit, if I can put it that way, and in my view, it was uh, hugely successful. So, really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say, Marlo. Thanks, Nick. Over to you. Okay, um, so as Nick's just told you, uh, I'm the RSGB Youth Committee Deputy Chair, and I was also had the wearing two hats, both as stream leader at Yota 2017 and as the team leader for the UK delegates. I've been in amateur radio since 2013, I also held an Arkwright Engineering Scholarship in sixth form, which was sponsored by the Radio Communications Foundation. My mentor, Mr. Hartley, just sitting over there. And as a result of all that, and all that I've learned, I am now on a Master's Electronic Engineering degree at the University of Southampton. So a little bit of background about YOTA. So since 2014, it's been officially part of and part funded by the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1. It started in 2011 with a summer event in Romania, and it's taken place every year since. Uh, so the UK got involved in 2014, the Finland event, uh, we then had Italy and Austria last year. And finally, three years after we first got involved, we hosted it down in Gilwell Park. There's also December Yota Month, which encourages young people to get on the air with special event call signs ending in Yota, which tour the country. And th this year, the UK has GB17 Yota, and if your club wants to host this and hasn't already applied, you've got about two weeks to do so, so do get a move on. And there are awards available for that, for, market, for um, working the station on multiple bands. So we're just encouraging actually all the amateur radio community to be involved with GB17 Yota, not just young people. So if you work the station, you might find yourself with an award. There is the Youth Contesting Program, uh, which is one of the IARU's ideas as well, um, and that essentially lets young people have a go at big gun or large contest stations. Uh, so I think uh, Phil Springer DK9SP or DK6SP, unsure on the numeral there, uh, went to 9 Alpha, 1 Alpha, um, and took part in that this year. And if you see last month's Radcom, there's a short write-up available on that. Um, there have been running, I think every fortnight or so, a Yota Scared, uh, which was young people talking to each other on HF, and I believe that'll be resuming within the month or so. So in terms of the activity plan, October 2016, exactly a year ago, saw us come up with the first draft activity plan for Yota. Um, we were grateful for the help of Kieran Clark, 2E0 NCN, who had been one of our delegates at Yota 2016 in Austria. So he was, he was able to give us feedback on what had worked well and what hadn't worked quite so well, helping to inform our planning process. That plan was constantly refined, though, um, much to Steve's annoyance right up till about Q2 of 2017, and uh, with some things being sorted about a fortnight before the event. But yeah, it all got done. There was a lot to fit in, and in, all, in all fairness, we had to have special event station operating, a build -a foundation licensed training, uh, amateur radio direction finding uh, at Gilwell Park, uh, and the intercultural evening, as well as trips out to the National Radio Centre at Bletchley Park, into London, and a SOTA activation. So how did we choose the site? So we had to consider the size. We'd have to fit around 80 attendees plus staff. I think it was about 15 to 20 staff we had in total. Transport links, we needed to be near major airports, hub airports serving Europe, and ideally rail as well for our volunteers, especially members of the youth committee, most of whom can't drive. Um, and existing radio facilities would have been a plus, which is how we came to the final decision of Gilwell Park Scout Activity Centre in Epping Forest, just north of London, which has 440,000 square metres of site, had great rail access to central London, uh, as well as uh, motorway access to airports. We had uh, Heathrow, Luton, Stansted, all within good distance. And again, uh, the main link of the M25, which I think James made about three or four trips on throughout the week and hated every moment of it. 
There you go. And the major benefit we had was um, GB2GP, uh, the station from radio scouting, had an exit has an existing shack and antenna setup that we were able to take advantage of. So uh, many thanks to them for that help, because that made life a lot easier for the cam hands. Our original plan for teams was to have 15 countries, each bringing five members. This changed fairly quickly, uh, given the demand we saw. So in reality, we ended up with 26 countries taking part for a total of 78 attendees. So not all the teams were even. Uh, our Norwegian delegation was just the one member and we had two come from Japan who were interested in seeing whether the Yota program could be brought into that region. Yeah, so some good distance involved. We had Algeria, South Africa, and as I've just said, the two from Japan, so uh, really from all over the world. Team UK was uh, Peter sitting at the front, just to embarrass him, in that rather fetching blue Yota shirt. Uh, Martin Radulov, who is joining us tomorrow at the convention, unfortunately he couldn't make it today, uh, myself, back when I was a found, uh, an intermediate licensee, and Jonathan M0JSX, who again, couldn't make it today because he's on holiday in Wales. One of our things in terms of keeping the amateur radio community up to date uh, was that uh, Heather Parsons, our communications manager at uh, RSGB headquarters, had planned a series of video blogs leading up to the event. So there were 17 vlogs that went out for Yota 2017, going from about March until through to August. So I'll just play you this short clip of one of our first vlogs that went out. And this was filmed at our initial planning meeting at Gilwell Park in February. We're busy arranging a whole host of activities for Yota 17, from ARDF to construction. I'm most looking forward to the ARDF. that this year is the seventh annual Yota summer camp and we're determined to make it the best one yet. Why don't you subscribe to the RSGB YouTube channel? You'll see all the new vlogs as soon as they come out and you'll see a lot of other interesting videos while you're there. So these vlogs were really nice, the response we got when these out went out both on Twitter and Facebook. So not only did they go out on social media, uh, so that all of our online followers could see what was going on, but they were emailed out by Heather to the regional team, uh, the RSGB leadership team, and we tried to make clubs, etc., aware of these so they could see what was going on and see what was being done effectively uh, as RSGB members with their money. So again, keeping all of you up to date. Arrival was a very busy day. Um, the first minibus left for Heathrow at Sam, I think. James, were you on that bus? Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, left for 7 a.m. and I don't think he returned until about lunchtime. Um, every attendee had the blue Yota t-shirt so they could be easily identified when we went on the London trip. Um, whereas staff had green shirts like this. Because we had, uh, we've all had our nice training on what to do if anything would go wrong. Had to be easily identifiable. Nothing did go wrong, just saying. Steve will be very pleased to know that. Um, There's a name badge and a, a blue wristband. And these had a free phone phone number on them again, um, which could be dialed from you know, call boxes, mobile phones. And that would go to our three event managers' mobile phones, again, in case of any issues. We then had our formal opening ceremony, which had speeches from the project managers. Uh, we introduced all the stream leaders and the volunteers who would be taking part. And uh, from Lisa Landers, who is the uh, IARU Region 1 Youth Working Group Chair. Uh, so she oversees the Yota program as a whole. The Sunday saw the much anticipated intercultural evening, where we shared a variety of food and drink, um, not all of it soft, native to their home countries. And what's really nice there, um, was a representative from the Romanian embassy came along to help that team set up. So uh, it was great, he just uh, drove up from London. And uh, that's what 30 meal deals looks like from Tesco <laughs> in Waltham Abbey. And I have to say, that's the, uh, the biggest and most expensive shop I've had to do. Um, that's it. We had quite a few who had arrived before lunch time, so they'd been told, don't arrive until after about 2 p.m. Um, but we did sort them out with food, so nobody went hungry. In terms of activities, we start off with a talk from Kevin and Lauren, um, who you'll all be aware have done the 214 Wainwrights in the Lake District. They just returned from that, I think, a few days before Yota. Um, and they told us about lightweight antennas. Um, one of them is the selfie stick Yagi, 
which if you see this month's Radcom is a write-up of how Kevin went about making that and designing it. So they've you know, told us all about how they'd repurposed different items, um, I think Nordic poles, the walking poles, screw the two of them together and you have a basic mast. Um, power sources as well, mobile phone battery banks are incredibly cheap and lightweight and with a little booster will happily drive a um, 13.8 volt radio. We then built and tested the 17 meter ground plane antenna kit that was provided by Sota Beams. And again, this was to go with the 17 meter um, CW receiver provided by QRP Labs, all the 17s adding up for Yota 2017. And this was all put into practice with a short visit to Wendover Woods and where we used some FT817s that have been loaned by Yesu UK, just giving everyone a taste of portable operating. So I just spoke about the uh, CW transceiver kit. This was a really nice bit of kit provided to us by uh, Hans Summers uh, G0 UPL of QRP Labs, uh, actually at cost. So I don't think he made any profit on them. I think, I believe Nick was telling me at Friedrichshaf and the, the poor fellow had been working round the clock to churn them out. Yeah, he did get them all there. I think we, we did have spares, which was lovely. Um, in terms of the build-a-thon, actually kit for that, things like the soldering irons, the tools, the multimeters, had been sourced with a grant from the RSGB Legacy Fund. Um, so they're looking at the, I think, the Bath Build-a-thon. They're doing that, aren't they, Steve? Yeah. Um, and the most difficult bit for most people was winding the toroids, but it was quite nice. We had three or four volunteers and experienced kit builders there giving us some assistance. Uh, it was really nice kit, as I've said. We had integrated test equipment as well as a, you know, a sig signal generator in there, which aided the debugging process for anyone that had issues. And also a software Morse decoder. Um, Morse actually proved itself to be quite useful throughout the week, or not useful, uh, very popular. Well, useful and popular. It's popular because it's useful. Um, so the software Morse decoder was useful for those who hadn't really encountered this mode before the nation assessments uh, or the Morse appreciation. So they were able to have some QSOs, sending the Morse very slowly and uh, just reading it off the software decode. And I know at least five people made contact that way. We then had the London tour. So it was uh, public transport down into Westminster. So it's the, the London Overground from Chingford and then just uh, the one change. So not many opportunities to lose our attendees. Um, we were then met by our tour guide, Maggie, who was actually the London tour guide of the year for 2017, and all of our stream leaders agreed that she was fantastic. They hadn't, we hadn't spoken to each other, but the first thing we said upon getting back and seeing Steve was, wow, Maggie is amazing. She just made the whole tour uh, interesting and engaging. She answered everyone's questions. There's nothing to which she didn't know the answer and it was a really nice, well-timed. So we started off in Westminster, seeing all the Parliament buildings, down into Whitehall, um, past Horse Guards, and then finally ended up at Buckingham Palace. And what was quite nice, uh, I think it was G Gadagano Ruseva, one of our um, attendees, said it was wonderful to see places that she'd only ever seen on TV before. So it was definitely doing the touristy things. It was great for our overseas visitors. They quite enjoyed the facility on the way back, so we were able to dive up to King's Cross to look at platform nine and three quarters. Uh, that was really easy adjustment. Um, unfortunately, there was a massive queue t to get the photo. There's a, a trolley, or half a trolley, that's been cut out and stuck against the brick wall there, so you can pretend to Harry Potter. Um, but they just took photos, which was quite good. Um, we did look at the Science Museum as well, so we had the, uh, the morning was spent doing the, the tour of the sites, the afternoon was in the Science Museum. And what was quite nice there was we saw Sir Tim Peake's re-entry module from his mission in 2016, which was a good link back to the GB1 SS school contacts that had taken place in 2016, uh, which the RSGB Youth Committee was involved with, the representation um, at those. We did go along to, I think, a good three of the events where we had availability, because we would be having an ISS contact ourselves later in the week. So we've linked back to the previous year. The foundation license uh, was a key part of the week as well. So we had all attendees were given the opportunity to complete the practical assessments throughout the week. 72 out of our 78 or 76 attendees had completed the assessments uh, or been signed off by the end of the week. Out of those 54 sat the exam, uh, a few of them just didn't turn up. We think they may have forgotten or ended up falling asleep somewhere. 
Um, we had a fairly reasonable pass rate of about two thirds. Um, the, the main issue there wasn't the technical knowledge, because they're all incredibly competent, but the language barrier. Because although conversational English might be very easy if you're not a native speaker, technical English or technical foreign language can be difficult for some uh, to grasp. Because they didn't seem to be aware either that you're allowed a word-to-word -word bilingual transit translation dictionary, um, which would be probably a learning point if the UK were to ever host such an event, an uh, international event again. Nice shaking head there from Steve. <laughs> <laughs> or a, a learning experience for... Yeah, so that's, just, that, that's not a talk about hosting it again, shall we? No, it's a good event, but very, very tiring week. Um, yeah, so they weren't aware that they could have the bilingual translation dictionaries. But otherwise, they all enjoyed the experience, and I think they found the insight to a different country's licensing system quite interesting. So I know, I don't think Germany has a foundation license. They just have novice and uh, class one. So we go Bletchley Park, saw a guided tour from Martin G3ZAY, who's got uh, plenty of experience. Uh, I think he did work as a tour guide or volunteer as a tour guide at Bletchley previously. Uh, included a demonstration of the Enigma machine and a bit of a talk on how that worked, as well as Turing's solutions. Um, the SOTA trip to Wendover Woods for my stream was rained off, unfortunately. We made the, what I believe, wise decision not to operate from a inside the minibus, but we just stayed at Bletchley and uh, Martin actually paid for us to go around the National Museum of Computing, having a look at the uh, Lorenz cipher, which was used over radio teletype. Um, so that was nice as radio amateurs, seeing that that mode we've used ourselves, seeing the history, seeing that it went back to the Second World War and probably before, um, and then seeing Colossus, which was the computer and that had been created to crack the Lorenz cipher. Of course, we also went to visit the RSGB's National Radio Centre, and we were able to operate as GB3 RS from the special event station there, and did work at the main shack back at Gilwell Park. ARDF, is Frank in the room? Where is he? Next door. Ah, oh, shame. I was about to say, Frank was evil with his <laughs> devising of the courses. Um, yeah, he's a bit of a, a Gilwell veteran, so he knows the site very well. Uh, he knows all the tricky places to hide transmitters. Uh, so we had our two courses on 80 meters and two meters. Uh, so we had us running all over the, uh, the 108 acres. There definitely most of the site was covered. In fact, the only rule was that there wouldn't be any transmitters in the pond, so don't go looking there. Um, and in the end, uh, M0SWN did win, so well done. Oh, we're well, not two meters. It was very nice to receive a letter from our patron, the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, this arrived, or was read out at least, the uh, Tuesday evening of our Aris contact. Uh, so I'll just quickly read that to you. I am delighted to have this opportunity to welcome everyone who is participating in the Radio Society of Great Britain's youth event, Youngsters on the Air 2017. The skills involved in amateur radio are a valuable foundation for careers in science, technology, engineering, and maths. I hope that all those taking part in this event will gain valuable, valuable experience for their chosen career. I wish all participants a very enjoyable week and trust that the friendships formed will last after the conclusion of the summer camp. Philip, patron, the Radio Society of Great Britain. And that was wonderful to have support from Clarence House. So the ISS contact, I did speak about this uh, earlier. Um, a little bit of a hint when we went to the Science Museum on that letter of support. This is with Paolo Nepoli, an Italian astronaut um, from the European Space Agency aboard the ISS. I think he's still there at the moment. If not, they'll have lost him. The contact <laughs> did fail initially, but this was um, due to a fault with the ISS equipment. So we could hear and s sorry, we could see Paolo via Ham TV at uh, Goon Hilly, um, Earth Station. And we knew he could speak to us because we asked him to give us a wave and saw the wave come through on ham TV. But he wasn't able to hear us. But we had the advantage of flexibility. Unlike with the school contacts, people weren't booked there for a few hours. We would be at Gilwell, what, for the rest of the week, but certainly around that evening. So we were really lucky to have a chance an hour and a half later on the second pass. Um, Kieran M0XTD from Aris UK rang Houston, um, and he actually came off the phone and said, yeah, what's that? Houston here. Houston here. 
Hey, hello. Yeah. The man who said yes. The man who said thank you very much for saying yes. That was fantastic. Um, yes, so for this attempt, he'd moved from the Ericsson handheld to a 25 watt unit in the Russian module, um, I believe to be the case. And that worked perfectly, although we couldn't see. 50 watts, was it? Ooh, yeah. It's much easier to hear. Um, yeah. Um, this sort of demonstrated the experimental nature of the hobby to our audience, who, wasn't, who, who weren't just radio amateurs, but we also had the scouts who were at Gilwell Park for their summer camp. So we'd spread the word about amateur radio. We'd shown what was a really quite fantastic thing we could do. It's what I would think is one of the coolest things we're able to do in amateur radio, speaking to space. Um, and we did have some really good feedback from those scouts. We've had four or five of them get in touch with the RSGB since, finding out about how they can get their foundation license and what's available uh, for young people in amateur radio. So a big part of the week was operating the special event station, which was GB17 Yota. And that was brilliantly set up by the Camhams, some of whom are here today, Hello, gentlemen. Um, and John Gascoigne from Radio Scouting, who is the uh, shack technician there at Gilwell. And they provided us with some fantastic tuition and guidance throughout the week. Uh, did you ever get to sleep? <laughs> Take that for a no. Um, you can see a little bit of the spread we had. Yeah, so uh, in the end, they were able to start at 6 a.m. Um, I feel sorry for you gentlemen having to get up before breakfast. It was incredibly competitive. There was certainly a rivalry. Um, technically, the UK won, but we self-disqualified because uh, the UK team had the distinct advantage of all the staff and volunteers on site also holding GM or 2E call signs. Um, so yeah, over 10,000 contacts in total, achieving 118 DXCC entities and 27 out of the 40 CQ zones. Our longest distance contact was Australia on 20 meters single sideband. Um, and it was quite interesting to see Morse was incredibly popular among our youngsters. So a fifth of the total contacts were made using mode. I think we did have a high speed telegraphy team there as well. that gave us a bit of a demonstration. Uh, it was on a paddle rather than a straight key, but they still managed quite amazing pace that my non-existent Morse, I'll put it that way, had no chance of keeping up with. Uh, we did also have uh, the support of our friends across the pond, so Friday saw a scheduled contact between our youth committee chairman and um, event manager Mike Jones, 2E0 MLJ as a GB17 Yota, and Bob Inderbitson, NQ1R at uh, Arrol uh, American Radio Relay League headquarters in Connecticut. Ofcom had also been incredibly helpful with the licensing for the event. So they'd confirmed that clubs could use a stroke Yota suffix throughout the week. Uh, so part of our strategy was encouraging these clubs to host barbecues or fun days, get young people involved and operate their club stations. And the NOV, the notice of variation that gave us the special event call sign, also allowed any foreign amateur to operate um, under supervision as opposed to just UK licensed amateurs. Our day trips out, our field parties, also work the main station. So from Bletchley Park, we managed to work them as a GB3RS. And also on our trip to uh, Baldock, to Ofcom's monitoring station, we worked as a um, GX8 general post office, stroke Yota, which was uh, nice to see that old club call coming back into use. In terms of technical expertise, there were varying skills among them. So some people were novices, at some things, but we all had a good level of experience and knowledge. The week, however, was about learning, and everyone learned something. Everyone took me away from the event that they hadn't tried before, that they were going to get into, and that was great to see. Um, Don Beatty, IARU Region 1 President, was really impressed with the skill level of the attendees. Um, if you watch the Friday Daily Diary, available on the RSGB YouTube channel, you'll see a short interview with him. Um, some people had held the initial impression, having read about past Yoda summer camps, that it's just a holiday. Uh, that was swiftly changed, I think, when he saw the actual results. They demonstrate technical ability as well with the 17-meter kit, um, especially when I saw someone doing a bit of fault-finding with dinner, which is a whole new meaning to fish and chips. 
There you go. And uh, the cam hams also provided a bit of a debugging service in the shack when they uh, had a moment of free time. Digital modes also proved incredibly popular. The German team set our record with seven different modes being used. And in fact, our longest distance VHF contact um, was Massachusetts in the USA on six meters FT8, which was actually a mode that had only been released, uh, um, released earlier in 2017. That is correct, isn't it? Yeah, check my facts. We were fortunate to be invited by Ofcom to their monitoring station in Bulldog as well for a tour and some various activities. 40 of our delegates were able to go, while the rest split between finishing the kits off, shack operation back at Gilwell Park, and uh, also a trip into London at their own expense to do a bit of shopping and see some more sites. It was really nice for us as UK amateurs to gain some insight into the issues facing our national regulator, and for me, having just started a university degree, to find out that they do a grad scheme. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, so, one of the activities was a bit of a DF competition using their field analyzers. And if you look closely here, you'll see Ofcom's DF pigeon. So, we were very close to being on a wild goose chase. Yeah, sorry, dreadful pun. Um, that was actually an 800 megahertz microphone transmitter, but that was a. Uh, very good. They, they said to me, oh yes, um, you're, you said what wild goose chase before, there's a hint. And that was me looking for a pond, but eventually did find it in the hedge near the main gate. Uh, there were some other things as well that we looked at. We um, had a bit of a look into their research labs uh, to have a screened um, chamber as well as a semi-anechoic chamber. Uh, and that was looking at the effect of various materials absorption on 5G frequencies, so uh, 20 gigahertz or so. Uh, so one of the main issues facing 5G is the higher bandwidth takes place at a much higher frequency, but a tree will drop it off at about minus 20 de decibels on the effect. Polystyrene though is fine, so if we replace all our trees with some uh, polystyrene, we'll be fine. I'll just play you this short clip as well. Go! That way again. Hey! Oh, that's the South Africans getting in there. Um, no synchronized, but that was good fun, and that was just uh, before the Iris contact. We did have a, a group photo taken, and all these available online if, if you should browse. Yeah, I think that was about half an hour before sunset that was taken. In terms of our team, the event simply would have not been possible without the work of all the people at RSGB headquarters, because it took a tremendous amount of their time, but also our dedicated team of volunteers who had all had to take a week off work. They'd had to use their leave to come along and help. You know, they traveled down, they stayed there for a week, but they made it a fantastic success. I won't do a Mike Jones and thank everyone now, else you'll be here for two hours. Some of you will get that joke more than others. Um, but there is a full li list available on the Yota pages on the RSGB website, so I'm careful not to leave anyone out. But if you do go online and uh, just have a list, and there is a tremendous amount of people who may not have been at the site for the whole week or may not have been at the site, but they did help us out and they've all lent their time, for which we are tremendously grateful. So in terms of media, a major benefit of Yota was raising awareness of amateur radio among the general public, but also among young people or younger radio amateurs who might not be aware that there are others like them in the hobby. To that end, Heather Parsons had planned a series of videos, the 17 vlogs that I'd mentioned previously, plus daily diaries, which poor Rob was up till at midnight again in the shack, editing every night to get them out in day, as well as some special videos and a live stream of the ISS contact. We also saw stories in various amateur radio outlets, including the uh, Arrol website. We had visits from ICQ podcast and uh, the TX Factor team, so they came down, had a chat to a few of us, uh, I think on the Monday or the Tuesday of the week, but they're available online if you go and watch those, and uh, we'll be retweeting those from the Youth Committee, RSGB Youth Committee Twitter account as well. And Heather is still finding online, uh, online articles as we go. Uh, she's doing a bit of a Google search and occasionally stumbles upon something. 
We also reached out to traditional media, so a press release on the wire service was uh, actually flagged up on my LinkedIn, and that's how I found, about, find, found out about it. That's a, a handy feature in terms of professional networking, because oh, your name's flagged up relating to radio. Um, and that saw 10 local newspapers in the regions represented by Team UK run articles. Um, we also saw, or rather heard, uh, local radio. And a bit of a lesson learned, which was um, Steve Thomas provided to me, is what happens if you try and do an interview with a one and a half meter long microphone cable standing under a six meter antenna. I'll quickly play that and you'll hear what happens. The future of amateur radio is very dynamic. There have been massive leaps forward in technology over the past 10, 20 years. And I think uh, we as radio owners should be leading. Yeah, so uh, that couldn't be used, uh, fortunately for me. I mentioned local radio. Um, thanks to Heather's efforts, I found myself up bright and early on the Wednesday, mo uh, on the Wednesday morning uh, to give a phone interview to BBC Radio Merseyside's breakfast show. I've uh, got a few edited clips here just to give you an idea of the interview. Uh, the whole thing is about five or six minutes. So I'll quickly let you listen to that while I cover my ears. 95.8 FM. BBC Radio Merseyside. Now, it's not uncommon for teenagers to spend uh, the nights talking to the mates on, on the phones or messaging them via social media, whichever platform uh, you care to use. But last night was a little bit different for one 18-year-old. Milo Noblet from West Kirby as part uh, of his evening was spent in conversation with an astronaut on board the International Space Station. As you do. Uh, Milo is an amateur radio enthusiast. He's used to talking to people all around the world. But I'm guessing this was a little bit unusual even for him. He's currently taking part in an event near London called Youngsters on air, but right now he's on the phone to me. Uh, Milo, morning to you. Good morning, Tony. How did you get inv involved in amateur radio? Is it something that uh, you picked up from, from a, a dad or an uncle or friends? How did it work? Uh, it was about year nine in school. I was involved in the cadets in the Navy section. Um, I had to go at sort of cadet radio. Right, so uh, CQDX, I'm seeking you long distance. You don't, you don't get much more long distance than the International Space Station, though, really, do you? Right, so you can communicate um, audibly, but you can also see easily as well. So, you know, throw the water droplets into the air and catch it in your mouth because it's floating around. It's not going to disperse everywhere because there's no gravity, that, that kind of thing. Do you think more people should take this up? Because in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, there was a huge CB radio boom in this country, but it was at a time when... You know, before mobile phones and before this mass communication of, you know, Skyping somebody on the other side of the world. Do, do you think it will ever see those, uh, that, that level of interest again? Sailing a boat, and I could just fly somewhere, or we could take a boat or an engine. But it's not as fun or challenging. We're not doing it under our own steam. So it's a bit of a unique hobby in that sense, in that we are entirely reliant on ourselves in this case. Is there a call sign you need to say when you're signing off? I know what CQDX is, I'm seeking you, et cetera, et cetera, but how, how, what would be an appropriate way to sign off our conversation in amateur radio terms? So we often say 73, which means best wishes. And that's it. Well, 73 to you, Milo. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. There you are. There's uh, Milo uh, Noble and uh, uh, his communications with the International Space Station. You see a little bit of my old CB knowledge coming out there. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no. We don't, those two letters, we don't say those. Um, yeah, we did quite well on that. In terms of potential reach on um, Radio Merseyside's breakfast show, it was about 340,000 people may have heard that. We don't have the actual listening figures. But we also had quite good engagement from the amateur radio community via uh, the, I, the iPlayer or web streaming um, and internet radio because this... Uh, Heather had put tweets out and Facebook posts out saying, Milo's going to be on the radio tomorrow morning. He's already really nervous about it. Go listen to him. <laughs> that was right. It was fine. Um, so, yeah, I think we've done quite well there. Hopefully, that will have made people who weren't previously aware of the hobby within the region more aware. In terms of the media strategy, I would say it's massively successful. We had 158,000 views of the Yota web pages on the RSGB website just in the month of August alone. Almost 20,000 YouTube views. 433,000 impressions on both Facebook and Twitter. 3.76 million potential reach in terms of local and national mainstream media. 
and about 350,000 national and international uh, amateur radio specific media as well, giving us a total potential reach of 4.75 million people who have not been aware of amateur radio, of what it involved, or that young people can take part in this hobby, which is a fantastic achievement, and I think the RSGB were very pleased with that result. There was overwhelmingly positive feedback from attendees and the IARU. That's something like 97% um, of the attendees rated it as good or excellent. I think that's the stat. Steve Nolling's head there, so I've not just made it up. Um, Jonathan, part of our team, said he would describe it as a week of intensive friendship building. So it wasn't just looking at technical aspects and learning new radio things, but networking and working across these national borders, having our friends uh, in the rest of the region, meeting people that we may have spoken to only on the radio before, or only on uh, you know, internet, IRC chats and the like. Um, it was a fantastic event. Lisa, um, who I mentioned before, Papa Alpha 2, Lima Sierra, our um, Region 1 Youth Working Group Chair, said that she really enjoyed the event and that it was great to see everyone so happy during the week. Uh, we've not had any negative feedback yet, and hopefully it's going to stay that way. So what's next for the Society? Well, we have Yota Month in December, I mentioned earlier. A GB17 Yota will be touring the country. Last year we had GB16 Yota, GB15 Yota, and we've done it ever since 2014. If your club wants to take part, they need to get their application in very soon. The deadline is the end of October, announcing uh, the allocations shortly after that. We're also looking at hosting a weekend event in 2018, similar to the event that took place in Wolverhampton in 2014, showing young people, both amateurs and not, what the hobby has to offer and potentially offering some of the foundation practicements. That is only an idea at the moment, uh, but that is part of our future strategy plan, so uh, do watch this space and look out for announcements. We are looking at our future strategy in general. We're going to be expanding or expanding be careful there with the wording, uh, our set of youth regional representatives. And the intention with this scheme is giving young people within each RSGB region someone they can talk to, a uh, focus point for amateur radio activities, They're representing us at these various events. We want to be working more with clubs. Uh, we're also liaising with the Training and Education Committee. That's an ongoing commitment we have to look at how they can tailor their training for young people as well as the activities they offer to make sure they're engaging people and keeping them interested. Uh, Rebecca Hughes, M6BUB, one of our youth regional representatives, has come up with the idea of a youth starter pack, which will be uh, either online but potentially printed out. And that's giving new amateurs or new young amateurs information about all that the society has to offer them, all the hobby has to, has to offer, and some tips for starting out. And further events we will obviously be attending things like Electromagnetic Field Camp in 2018, which is a uh, sort of maker stroke hackerspace gathering uh, taking place in the West Country this year. It was in Guildford back in 2016. And I believe uh, Derek sitting in the audience went down, did a bit of a presentation about what amateur radio has to offer. Because these are people who may be playing with software-defined radio, may be playing with electronics, uh, may do it as a profession, but actually aren't aware that there is the pre-existing hobby of amateur radio and a, a licensing system that will allow them to do so with more power or on more interesting frequencies. We're also working with the Radio Communications Foundation, so I've been part of two days for Arkwright Engineering Scholars that took place at Bletchley Park, and that saw about 15 scholars each time completing all the foundation assessments and then sitting the exam. And the majority of those, I think oh, well over 90%, had a pass and then went on to be radio amateurs. We're also looking at working with university wireless societies, keeping existing wireless societies going, seeing if dormant societies can be restarted, and also encouraging universities without amateur radio societies to uh, liaise with their local clubs or perhaps see if it's possible. And I believe the, RC, uh, I believe the RCF is working with the UK Electronic Skills Foundation to that end as well. So if you go to uh, commsfoundation.org, was it .org? Yes. Um, you'll be able to read some more about that, and hopefully there'll be updates available on that process as we go. 
I've also got a sneak preview of the latest video in production from RSGB headquarters. I was sworn to secrecy before the lecture by uh, Heather Parsons, because this is a, a first cut, so this is not the final edition. Uh, so you're quite lucky to be seeing this. Bit of a surprise for you. And uh, let's just see what that is. I like uh, DXing, contesting, just uh, HF in general. Building things. Satellites. Uh, what I like about amateur radio is uh, contesting. I like really the com competitive part of, uh, aspect of that. Uh, kit building, I built a lot uh, at home uh, using my soldering iron. And I like uh, worldwide flora fauna activities going out in, uh, in nature. Well, I, I love the practical work, but I think the most exciting still remains um, a, a great pile up on SSB. There's, that's, that's a difficult question because there's so much. Uh, I like uh, make a kit and QSR. SDR. Contest. My favorite thing about your radio is the ability to talk to people around the world and you never know what you're going to get. Uh, it's uh, different every day and it's uh, a lot of fun and very exciting. Uh, the f my favorite part about radio amateur is tinkering with the, with the radios, improving them and making something my own. Friendship. A bit of a piece of wire can get to the other side of the world. I like the social part, so I can um, have contact around the world. I like those new things like digital modes, meter scattering and sat satellite communications. International. I've had my license for about six months and so far I like building an S, training CW, and working SSB pileups on Yota, time T17. Uh, all of them, it's uh, a very broad category and uh, I've just done a, a RDF for the first time. It was great, it, it was really great and fun and uh, now I'm going to move to meter scatter propagation on six meters I think and that's incredible, there's so much things to do and you, you never run out of them. The only limit is your fantasy. So actually in the background of that video, is I've just seen Rob giggling about, you can see him working on the live display we had in terms of a league table of how the different countries were doing. Um, I think the Camham's actually decided to switch that off for the last 12 hours or so of operating to uh, add a bit of mystery to the event, because there was a serious rivalry on there. There were people fighting over shack operation slots. <laughs> but, uh, fantastic event. Um, so I'll be happy to take any questions. We've got about five minutes or so. No? Lovely. I've, have I covered everything then? <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much.